May 29, 2002 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. We are light one board member tonight, Mr. Keneally uh, is missing. Hopefully he'll show up before we get too far in. Um, other than that, we have a full complement of board members. Uh, first item on our agenda is the approval of our minutes of April 23, 2002. Comments from members of the board on the Just a minute. The minutes we have are dated March 26. I assume that should, did we have a meeting in April? I don't believe so. We didn't have a meeting in April. So this is uh, the first item on our agenda is to approve the minutes of our March 26, 2002 minutes. Comments from members of the board on the March 26, 2002 minutes. <clears throat> um, I have just a couple small items. Um, on page two, line 41, um, I would propose deleting the words where it says, I'd like to delete the words, the application of, so that line 41 reads mm. that Marianne and John Doherty's conditional use application for the property located at 30 Hunts Point Road. Um, then on line 42 of the same page, it refers to specifically seeking a condition use permit. And of course, instead of condition, it should simply be conditional use permit. Um, on page 3, line 38, it refers to a motion for the application of a variance of 10 feet, 10 feet from the required 40 feet. Um, and I, the application was actually a, variant, a request for a variance of 10 feet from the required 20 feet. So it should be 20 instead of 40. And those are my only comments. Others? Could we have a motion from someone to approve the minutes? I motion to approve the minutes. Uh, Ms. Jordan? Yeah. Second? A second. Mr. Tranfaglia? <clears throat> um, all those in favor of approval of the minutes um, with the proposed Changes? Opposed? The minutes are approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. <clears throat> uh, next item on our agenda is old business to hear the request of Stephen and Sarita Solomon for Kettle Cove Road, tax map U16, lot 7A, for a front property line variance of nine feet from the required 25 feet a left side property line variance of five feet from the required 25 feet, and a right side property line variance of 15 feet from the required 25 feet uh, to replace the existing ranch with a one and a half story cape with attached porch. And I understand that the Solomons are not here tonight. That's correct. Solomons are not here. Um, Mr. Smith, can you update us on the status of this? Um, at the last, at the last minute before why we canceled the uh, the April mi minute meeting was because they weren't prepared to uh, go before the board, and they asked to be uh, kept on the agenda 
but not heard until they completed their application satisfactorily. And I suspect that they have hired a firm to do that, and I suspect that they'll be probably before the board next month. So do we simply keep them on the agenda as old business from month to month until I, I did. they decide they're not going to appear? Well, see, the problem was at the, at the time that we had to advertise and get the agenda out, I didn't know whether they were going to appear or not. So I had to put it on. So yes, I'll continue to do that at least through next month, and then we'll find out whether they're serious or not. Um, you think we need to table this? Or do we not just not take it up? I think I think you can just not take it up because that's what. Well, okay. Well, it's up we'll to do you. That. You can do either one. You can table it because the applicant isn't ready. That's. I think it's a matter of sem semantics, but. Well, we'll simply not take it up, and if it continues on next month's calendar, we'll consider it. Again, if the Solomons are here and if they want us to take it up at that time, we will. Uh, without having taken it up today, uh, we'll simply skip over it and go on to new business. Uh, first item of new business is to hear the administrative appeal of Michael Richard and Susan Barnacle, 1 Maiden Cove Road, tax map U05, lot 40, of the Code Enforcement Officer's denial of building permit number 020531, on May 13, 2002. And we have Mr. Richard and Ms. Barnacle here tonight, represented by Council uh, Joe Maziotti. If you would tell us your name, please, and your business address. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Joe Maziotti. I'm an attorney, and my practice is at 555 Forest Avenue in Portland, Maine. Uh, I represent Michael Richard and his wife, Susan Barnacle, uh, who are the owners of the property at 1 Maiden Cove Road in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, they purchased the property in February of this year and have filed this administrative appeal from the denial of the code enforcement officer's uh, issuance of a uh, building permit. The basis of the appeal, as I've stated in the information that was supplied, is a letter from 1969 where this board granted a hardship variance for the construction of a single family dwelling at one Maiden Cove Road. The language of that variance refers to a one story house and the appeal is brought so that the, uh, my clients would be able to finish uh, the second floor of that house which is presently the attic. The language of that first variance uh, is qualified by a reference to an abutters property and the height limitations that a one-story building would impose. Uh, it appears that the board was concerned with the obstruction of the view of Dr. Frederick's property if the building that was built at one Maiden Cove Road was any higher than a single story. Uh, it is that language that we would like this board to construe uh, so as not to limit the interior uh, reconstruction or renovation of the home, but apply in a limited way to the height of the building. The building was built in conformity with the, uh, with the plans. Uh, in fact, we have a copy of the original plans from uh, about 30 years <coughs> ago. And the building is built in accordance with those plans. And according to the records in the town office, there have been no reported violations of any building code or other ordinance. So we can only infer from that uh, that the building was approved for its occupancy the way it was constructed. So the building as it's presently configured was one acceptable to the town. Once the property has been, uh, has been re renovated in, uh, on the interior, uh, there will be no changes to the footprint of the building, its height, uh, or its use in any way. Uh, I just want to be sure that the board is aware that what this request is, is limited to the interior of the building. The only exterior changes would be to the, would be the addition of a dorma and an eyebrow dorma over the entranceway. Uh, otherwise, the setbacks, the height of the building, and its, uh, its footprint would remain uh, completely unchanged. 
So I would ask that the board uh, reverse the decision of the code enforcement officer uh, by interpreting that language not to apply to the interior renovation of the property, but only to its exterior. I'd you be said happy that this wouldn't be changing the use, um, but it would be in the sense that now you would be kind of expanding up into the unused attic portion. Well, the use is the same. The use is still as a single family residence. So that wouldn't change. They may have more bedrooms, but it's still uh, the, the use of the property would remain unchanged. <clears throat> what will be in the second story now? Three bedrooms? I believe that's correct. Yes. What did the neighbors say? Uh, so far, the response has been favorable. It's the, uh, the planned changes are improvements to the home, and I think that enhances the properties around it. Uh, that the, uh, uh, Mr. Richard and, and Ms. Barnacle have been careful to solicit the, uh, the input from neighbors. They've consulted with, I know, several of them in order to show them the plans and be sure that they're aware of what's being done uh, so that I think that, uh, in general, the neighbors are supportive. Um, well, who does Dr. Ferguson still live in the property? No, I don't believe so. I, no. Which property was he in? Believe it or not, he was not on the ocean side. Really? <laughs> That's the mystery of this, correct? What, what property was he in, though? Do you know? Um, Have you talked to Harold? And. Did they respond? Okay, when did you notify them? Personally. We did send notice to, to, to all about us uh, within 300 feet, and I did get three inquiries, um, all of which said thank you. and and didn't seem to have a problem with, once they found out the height was not gonna be an issue. Okay. Did the Freedmen's respond? No. Okay. It, which property was that? Which property again was the Ferguson property? When I was out looking at the house, I was trying to determine which one might have had. Do you know by the map? It, it's the property on the ocean side. Oh, it is the ocean side? Because I thought it was. Can you reference okay. the lot number? I think it's 41. Please. Right. That, yeah, that, that, was the, that was the issue. It was the ocean side, we couldn't figure out well, what view they'd lose. Well, what view would have been obstructed by the construction of the house at any height? That's, That's the mystery. That 41 is the one which sits lower than you, isn't it? Yeah. Well, let's, um, since we're not picking up Mr. Richard's comments by microphone, um, if you want to have an opportunity to speak, we'll certainly give you that opportunity, but rather than have you um, trade exchanges with the board when you're not being picked up by the microphones, and so the, the vast viewing audience on CETV <laughs> isn't getting the pleasure of your responses, we'll give you a chance to come up to the microphone because I'm sure that everybody out there on listening land will want to hear. <laughs> so, um, other questions for Mr. Maziotti, if anyone has any. I guess, do you have any written statements on who's opposed to it or who's in support of it, other than? No, we, there have been no statements offered by either side. We know of nobody who opposes it. Uh, it is just basically through conversation uh, between the owners and the abutters that generated the positive uh, response that we've gotten. Um, I'm sorry, this, you had your hand up. Um, are, are you here to speak in favor of or in opposition to this? I just wanted to make the comment that I'm one of their neighbors and I'm here in... Okay, well, we'll give you an opportunity also to speak at the microphone, but I simply want to know, is there anybody else here to speak in favor or in opposition to this? 
I can tell you that I did. Uh, I had a, a telephone call from uh, Mrs. Barras today, who has no problems with it. The other three that I that, that I had telephone conversations with, I had no problems. I didn't. I didn't get the names. They didn't share that with me. They just was. They they got to notice. They wanted had questions, and then they said thank you. And the height issue was 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 basically the same issue that you're here for. Who is that you're referring to? Excuse me? Who, who are you referring to that had no opposition? Well, Mrs. Barras was, was one of them. I'm not sure the names of the others because um, it was just they called and asked questions and then they said thank you. So I didn't, I should have got the names for the record, but there was nobody opposed, in other words. And we don't mean to suggest that it's incumbent upon an applicant to poll the neighborhood. Uh, with a petition because that's not your obligation. The obligation is for the town to give legal notice and if anybody's interested enough, it's incumbent upon them to contact the code enforcement officer or come to town hall and inquire about the nature of the application and appear at the hearing if they have an objection. Uh, Mr. Trinfaglia, did you have a question? It, uh actually several, and one of them is just understanding the chronology of the application process. Um, looking at your packet, the um, application wasn't dated, uh, but the appeal to the denial was dated May 9th, but your denial was dated May 13th. He, he knew he was going to, he knew what I was going to, uh, he knew what my decision was prior to my issuance of the denial. The, and, and I suggested that it, because of, of that circumstance, that did he get his paperwork in if he wished to appeal my decision? Thank you. The, the second question I had is, um, <clears throat> looking at the initial application, I don't think, and I, I ask you, I guess, Bruce, I don't think the appropriate avenue would be a permit because I think we would, my understanding would need a, a variance. The total living area, even though the height and the footprint of the building isn't being changed, the total living space is increasing greater than 25 percent. Isn't that part of a non-conforming use if that's going to um, be a variance? Uh, <clears throat> there is a 25 percent sewer. On, on sewer, there's a 25 percent building coverage max, mm -hmm. but there's no building coverage increase. In a shoreland zone, there's, a, there's, a, there's also a 20 percent impervious coverage limitation, and there again, there's no footprint increase. Uh, and within 75 feet of the high water mark, which it, which it isn't, there's a 30 percent expansion limitation, which does not apply. Thank you. And the 30 percent expansion doesn't apply, Bruce, because this is not an expansion at all. It's simply a finishing of, an, of existing space. No, because although the property may be in shoreland zone, it's only the first 75 feet from the high water mark that's limited to 30 percent. Beyond 75 feet within shoreland zone, you can expand to whatever degree you want, providing you don't increase by more than 20 percent impervious surface coverage or 25 percent of the lot area, whichever is more restrictive. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Maziati? Would um, either Mr. Richard or Ms. Barnacle like to uh, comment on their request? They're certainly not obligated to, but they have the opportunity to if you would like them to, or if they would like to. If you would like, you're welcome to, but I, I think all that needs to be said has been said, just not by everybody. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Maziotti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, other uh, people here to speak in favor of the, what is this, a appeal? Would you like to no, no, address the board? Yes. Yes, you would like to? No, I have to <laughs> No, you don't want to. <laughs> Um, nobody else to speak in favor of or in opposition to the appeal? Then that will close the public comment portion of the hearing and open it to board discussion.
Do we still have the opportunity to ask questions? Of oh, if we would like, if you would like to question them, then by all means. Um, who would we like to have up here to field the questions? I, I, Dr. Chavis, I didn't mean to cut off questions from the board. Uh, I'll start with you, please, if I may. If I can, and I apologize for bringing you back up. How many total dormers are to be added to this structure? There are two. Uh, two dormers and one, what they call an eyebrow dormer over the entranceway. Uh, it's a much smaller dormer. The two being front and rear, the full armors on the front and the rear, is that correct? Uh, that, I, that's, it's an oddly oriented house, the way the roads run around it, so the front and rear are a bit misleading, but yes, I think you're correct, it would be the front and rear. You, it, in this packet, you show three elevations. Uh, you do not show the front door elevation, is that correct? You show what's labeled as a west elevation, an east elevation, and an unmarked elevation, which I appear to assume is the rear elevation. <laughs> there are actually um, Maybe the confusion so we can clarify this. There are actually two sets of um, drawings, I think. Is um, there's, I, I, I think, while I let the, uh, the appellants answer the question, but I think these are the original construction drawings. The Dr. Chapman is asking about. Those are, those are the original from 1969. Those aren't the ones that include the changes that have to be made. So just so we're clear, there's, there are three pages from the n original 1969 drawings that show an east elevation, west elevation, and unmarked. But the east and west show that this is a house for Mr. and Mrs. Richard. And it's cut off after that, H-O-L-D. Holden. Holden. And you've simply supplied those to us for our information as historical background on what was originally designed to be That's built. Exactly. The, uh, the elevation uh, that you asked about where it shows uh, a doorway on this eyebrow uh, dorma is the front. Uh, there's only one eye eyebrow dormer being added, is that correct? Right. Yes, that and is. And that appears to be over the front door, is yes. that correct? And the, what you were described as the front and rear full dormers on this front elevation are, are they, these two, is that, that correct? That is correct. Which are facing the left of the front door to the right of the front door. Exactly. On the front ridge that protrudes forward toward the street, I assume made in the code. Is that correct? Yes. I'm trying to establish where the three dormers are, the the, the two full dormers and the eyebrow dormer. Is that correct? Yes, the eyebrow dormer faces. Maiden Cove? It actually faces Sir, because the house is situated right on a fork, so that dormer faces Sir. The dustpan dormer to the left, to the right to the right of that eyebrow, directly to the right, faces Maiden Cove. And the dustpan dormer, the other dustpan dormer faces Sir and Garden the rear of the house. So when you are facing the front door, you can see all three additions, is that correct? From yes. one location? Yes. So there is no structural change, evident structural change on the lot 41 side of the property, is that correct? 
the structural change that will be viewed from lot forty one will be the the other drawing that shows this continuous dormer double gable with shed in the middle dormer will be evident from lot forty one. Any changes on this elevation? On the none on the elevation. Just yeah, the, Assuming lot 41 is the location of Ferguson, this is correct. That's what you stated earlier from your seat. So any structural changes from lot 41 will not be evident. Is this correct? I think, I think what he's saying, and I mean. Yeah, that, that is visible from lot 41. This entire back dormer, the two, five windows, this is completely no, and that's what 41 would see when they were looking out their door. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. It's also what 37A, which is across the street on Maiden, would see. Is that the addition? That's the part of the addition that would be exposed to them from their roof. They the roof line would change. The roof line, which they presently view, would change the, side angle. the door. Yes, yep. they would see it in profile. Who is the current owner of Lot 41? And has this? Had, I don't know that I fully heard you earlier. Have you discussed this with him? We have not. We left a letter in the mailbox. We, we stopped, popped in and introduced ourselves and just through Nancy and Jim, neighbors of ours, who popped in to show their support and offered to come here tonight, they had said they had discussed it with them and other surrounding neighbors and everybody seemed to be very pleased that we we're going to improve the house. The are they full-time residents? They are. Year-round residents? They are. Within the no, it wasn't just a no, it's the exact copy of what you folks have. I made a copy for each one of the neighbors who might be affected, the Friedman, the folks in the casino, the Bay Rosses, which you mentioned. So they got a note along with copies exact to what you have, so they are aware of what the plans look like. Somebody did have men mentioned 37A. My wife did have a conversation with the lady who lives in the house in 37A. And she was also she also approved of the improvements to the house. And today, the, your house has how many bedrooms? Two. And after modifications, it'll have three. After modifications, actually, it'll have after modifications, it'll have four bedrooms, and one of the downstairs bedrooms will be converted to an office. In the, the basement or the daylight basement currently, is there any bedroom space? In there? Uh, there is semi finished off space, a half bath in a finished off room, which will be a will be a game room. So both bedrooms are in what from the maiden coat side are on the ground floor, the first floor. Exactly. Are all pitches of the roof the same? Uh, it appears that they were 9 and 12. Is that the same for all existing pitches of the roof? The pitches of, of the roof on the, I'm not sure, <coughs> no, I haven't checked, but the pitches of the roof of made on Maiden Cove and on Syrup appear to be the same. If I was to guess, it may be a 9-12 pitch. In, in your reviewing of this, this is a is there a Typical, I'm asking the attorney, 
maybe you've done this research, maybe you haven't. Is there a typical ridge height for a one-story house? Let me read to you, if I may, a definition from Webster Thank you. as to what one story means. The first definition is a set of rooms on one floor level of a building. The second definition is a horizontal division of a building exterior, not necessarily corresponding exactly with the stories within. That's the entirety of the definition. Well, that clears everything up. <laughs> <laughs> that the exterior can be different than the interior in the definition of the story. Would you read that again, please? The second definition is a horizontal division of a building's exterior, not necessarily corresponding exactly with the stories within. And the first definition? A set of rooms on one floor level of a building. <clears throat> Did, did you, in your explorations, come across a minimum and a maximum ridge height for a one-story house? Did you ever come across a, a number? No, I, I can't say that I ever have. Uh, I don't think that there is any specific <coughs> definition for that. If you have an A-frame building, uh, it's a single story but may have an extraordinarily high uh, roof pitch. I, I think that it, to get back to the variance letter that was issued by the board, uh, it seemed to be designed to protect a particular abutter and not necessarily driven by what would take place within the building. They were really concerned with its height, its physical location, and its impact on the neighboring properties. And those all seemed to be conformed to the plans that were designed and the way the structure was built. So I, I believe that that really was what was driving the planning board's decision at the time. It's pretty hard to go back and substitute our judgment or our, our, our uh, fact for what we don't know. But intuitively, it seems that they made the they took the time to describe the impact on an abutter, so that appeared to be uh, the in, the motivation for limiting the property to one story. Uh, the way it's designed and built. I suppose you could take the position that it's different than one story, but that's what was approved and what they allowed. So I think that that becomes its own definition. So the original plans uh, are the way the building was constructed. My intent of those questions was an effort to find out what the original intent of that letter was. If it were a, a one story, building could have a flat roof or a shed roof, as there are several examples in Cape uh, Typically, a lot of the ranches you see here are, are shallower pitch roofs, 5 and 12, or thereabouts. And this, this is quite a high pitch roof for a one-story house, it appears. And my, the question I have is what was that original intent? And that's why I was asking the range. Well, I think that if, if it was different from what was constructed, there probably would have been some notation in the file that that violated what was intended by the board at the time. So for 32 or three years now, the building has existed the way it was originally constructed unchanged. So I, I think that we can fairly assume that uh, that what was intended at the time was carried out. Otherwise, there would have been some objection raised by somebody over the last three decades. How many story houses plot what party Do you know that? Two and a half. Two and a half. Sorry, Dr. Chappas, what was your question? Lot 41, which was the reference Dr. Ferguson gave in his letter. I was asking what height or story height was that house on lot okay. at that time. And you say it's two and a half story? Two and a half story. <clears throat> the other, the thing I'm concerned about, I think, is we're focused on the intent with respect to Dr. Ferguson's property. But I, I'm also seeing that the purpose of the 1969 Variance was also to erect a two-bedroom, one-story home. So I, I, I'm 
kind of questioning what the intent was the intent to limit this to a smaller home um, and if so it may be because it's really close to the Friedman property um, in one spot it's it's only six feet from the property line in another spot eight and another spot ten so I'm wondering if the intent of the variance was also to limit the use of this house limit the noise and the impact upon abutting neighbors I, I think even at the time that would have been uh, probably more clearly stated if that was their intent, because I think that goes beyond the variance, that if you allow a property to be constructed for a single family residence, I'm not sure that you can further limit its internal design. I think once you've crossed that threshold, it really is the exterior of the property uh, that's controlled by the, the issuance of the variance. So I, I think that there would have been something more uh, explicit stated in the in the letter if there was an attempt uh, to restrict its use. Well, I guess it does, kind of, because it says that to erect a two-bedroom. So it, it has kind of limited yeah. down. Uh, I think that that was reflected in the plan, is that they were looking at a set of plans, and that's the way they described it. Uh, I don't believe it was necessarily related to a restriction on its future uh, future use. If you look at the attic space, there are we have some photographs of that. Uh, the floor has always been finished. Uh, it runs all the way to the eaves, so it's a, uh, a wood floor, a wood subfloor uh, that was that was created in the uh, in the original construction. So I, I'm not sure that in, at the time the uh, the property was was constructed and, ins and inspected, uh, it was uh, it was as it exists now. The, uh, These are additional photographs, Mr. Chairman. If I might offer these, uh, it may help clarify the, at least the construction that I've already Why don't you start these down at the other end with, uh, with Michael, Mr. Trent Baglia. You're willing to part with them now that you've given them the board, correct? Yes, absolutely. We, we can take more. <clears throat> what uh, these additional five windows at a higher level will be facing what portion of the house on lot 41, the side of the house? The side of the house, the driveway, the driveway side. Driveway, garage side of the house. Yeah. Are there any trees between? Your house and their house. There are. Does it appear to you that the addition of these five windows will affect, uh, have any impact on the privacy issue? No. For the dwelling on what? No. Thank you. It's the driveway exactly. This driveway is pretty mature tree in between there. Can you point to the exact language in the original appeal that supports your argument? In the uh, second full paragraph, at the, the last sentence, a two-story view, a two-story house would cut off the latter's view. Uh, in reference to Dr. To Dr. Uh, Ferguson's property. That that single sentence. Yes, I, mean, I think is that's foundation. The uh, because the, that paragraph talks about the reduction of the setbacks and the uh, and talks about the elevation of the property and defi I mean, it, it says very explicitly that a, a, a taller house would have an impact on a neighbor's property. So I think that that is reasonable to conclude that that was their motivation for limiting the elevation of the house to its to its current configuration. So I also I find that, that the paragraph, the same paragraph that Mrs. Miller pointed to earlier, construction of these of these two 
construction of this two-bedroom, one-story house on a single lot is to be started prior to July 17th. That seems to catch the essence of what the board's intent was at that time. Two-bedroom, one-story home. I, I, I can only, uh, it's hard to go back and, and know what they were looking at, but I think that it, it would refer to a set of plans. Uh, that's typical in the way people describe properties. It's the number of bedrooms it has. It gives you some size of its, uh, some sense of its size and its its character. Uh, I don't think it's a definitional statement. I think if you go back to the original paragraph, uh, first paragraph of, of the uh, Board of Appeals decision, um, unanimously granted your appeal from the decision of the building official denying you were building permit to erect a two-story a two-bedroom, one-story house. It could have been that that was the denial that came down from the code office, and that got, I, I, I'm speculating, but that, that got put through in that same verbiage. So you think it's the same language that just follows through continuously throughout? Knowing the history of, of boards, um, generally speaking, you don't look at the number of bedrooms um, within a dwelling. You do, you know, you do look at issues of privacy and the like, but generally speaking, you don't focus on bedrooms. Well, I'm, I've been looking through the ordinance and reading the 1969 decision of the board, trying to decide just sort of procedurally what we're supposed to be doing with this. Um, whether this should be a request, a new request for a variance, whether this is a request to modify the previous order or decision of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, I mean, it seems to me that we have to, if, if we're to grant your appeal, we have to do more than simply reverse our code enforcement officers decision denying well, I think make an interpretation of what the what the former board wanted to accomplish and then based on that if that interpretation says that it was all to do with the height then the reversal then I could th then reverse the, the denial of the building permit I think that's well I, may I mean we can decide that the intent was to save the view, uh, but we still have a variance that was granted in 1969 that permits the construction of a two-bedroom, one-story house. And it seems to me that despite what we think their intent was, well, we, we still have a variance that says it can only be a one-story house. So if we're, gonna, if we're inclined to permit you to have a two-story house, the question is, do we need to undo or modify the previous decision from 1969? I guess I'm asking that because I don't know the answer to it. Well, I can I'm tell you that open that any I, input or thoughts what, that Mr. Maziotti or members of the board have. From what I had for conversations with, with our attorney, um, the town attorney, that, that you can't, the time to reverse that decision would have been an appeal to a court by the applicant or a reversal by the board within 30 days if you wanted to change the variance appeal. And you may want to elaborate on this, but I don't, I, I think that's kind of a tight issue. Uh, I, I did speak with Michael Hill, the, the uh, town's attorney, and this is not as clear cut as any one of us would like it to be. The, uh, the issue, though, I think comes down to whether or not the interior of the space can be developed within a one-story house. We are not asking that a variance be granted expanding this to a two-story building. That, that isn't the request. The, the number of stories will be as they were originally approved and originally built. The only issue is whether or not the renovations can take place within that building, and does that, is that within the purview of the language uh, or the intent of the language of this original variance? So we are merely looking for the board's clarification as to the restriction on the development of the, or the renovation to the attic space of that building and the installation of dormants. If this 
for instance, if this were not a property that was the subject of a variance, anywhere else, the building permit would issue as a matter of course, as a matter of right. It is only because it was originally the subject of a variance that we thought it necessary to bring it back before the zoning board uh, in order to ensure that the language that our proposed use and changes would be within the parameters of that original variance. So it is for that reason we're here, and it is a fairly a li limited appeal in its scope. So we're not asking for an expansion of the variance, only an interpretation of that letter uh, to permit the renovations. I think that's a very strong argument when, when you say it's confined to the interior of the attic. You're looking to improve the attic. But up until the time you add dormers, and that changes the exterior. It, it does not change the exterior in a way that would be defined under the zoning ordinance since there are no required changes in the setbacks or the footprint or any of the uh, impervious surface requirements so that it really doesn't change any of those types of things that are covered by the ordinance. Uh, we've stayed uh, clear of those and the only change would really affect the interior. Just a point of, it does. and I'm not sure how this ties in except I think it does somewhat. If, if this building the structure was built prior to a setback change which made it non-conforming and the floor, the, the attic space had been floored over to the, to the eaves, even though that space wasn't finished off, I issue a permit to dormer that area because there is no increase in usable space. Uh, so had it not had it not had a variance, have to have a variance then, but it needed one now, it, it, or, or became non-conforming now, I would not send this to the board for a variance because the space is already existing, because it's been floored over, assuming from day one. Not, the records don't indicate anything other than what was built and accepted. The, the records indicate that that's what was built and accepted. So. That said, it is an expansion of headroom, but not floor space. So I don't know if that helps at all. Um, so I, I think, I think if I'm smarter and I understood it might help. So how does this work again? Because they have the floor space there. If I have two houses side by side and yeah. they were both built prior to the setbacks that made them non-conforming today, and one is got, they both got 10, 12 pitches on them, and one of them's got no floor, and one of them's got a full floor, then, then it's been my interpretation of the ordinance because there's always been usable space, even though it wasn't finished, that the person with the full floor or the or partial floor of his knee walls could have a permit to bump that up because they're not increasing the usable space. But the person without the floor, they are now creating usable space and they'd have to come back to the board to get a variance. But even if the floor is just for like storage, I mean, there's still no heat that's, or water. That's that's what I that's my interpretation. But you certainly wouldn't consider the either of them to be one-story properties, would you? Couldn't wouldn't wouldn't. You wouldn't consider either to be one-story properties at that point. I mean, you consider if you if you're carving a living area in, into a floor above an existing floor. I can tell you if I was a code officer on day two or day one, I questioned the validity of this being a one story, but I think that's a moot point because right. I think right. from what I indic what, right. what the files don't indicate is, uh, is that, 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 that there was any problem with what was built there. Was there, is there, was there and is there a staircase to get up to the second floor yes. or was it always? Staircase and an elevator. Stel staircase and a what? And an elevator. An elevator? <laughs> I interpreted those words as just a description of people trying to put down what is it that's going to be built there, and that those were the words that they chose to use at that point in time. And it happened that they selected very definitive term, you know, a definitive term to somebody might, you know, single, um, you know, just a, you've got multiple floors there. When you've got an attic, you have multiple floors. And so that's not a single-story building. It's multiple floors. 
So I interpret it as those are the words they chose to use at that point in time. And now our decision is we can't go back and figure out, you know, rewrite history there. It, our job is to say, okay, the structure height isn't changing. Can we define how somebody chooses to use their interior? If they want to put, you know, a bedroom up there, if they aren't obstructing anybody's view? Well, in an extent, the, the ordinance permits us to, because certainly we've looked at applications where somebody right. has had a barn and they want to convert that to an apartment. Right. And that may not change the exterior, but it does change how... But it's not changed. They aren't changing the purpose of the dwelling. The purpose of the dwelling is to live in it. That's true. And yes, the word said two bedroom. But probably the person who stood there said, I'm building a two bedroom house because that's what they were doing at that period in time. They might have been building a three bedroom house. Yeah, that, that is true. Well, I agree with Ms. Jordan's comments completely. I think that's exactly what happened. I guess my only question, my only concern is more for the property owner. Um, are there any problems created down the road with this 1969 variance sort of of record um, for a two bedroom, one story house? If all we're going to do is make a declaration of what the intent was in 69 as opposed to actually changing the words of this in some way to permit something more, to expressly permit a two-story home, but not to exceed the existing height. Because it seems to me that by finishing this space, no matter what you call it, you have a two-story home when you're done. If you go back I to agree the that the restriction is you can't go any higher. And so what I worry about is what, is, what can of worms are we opening up? You know, is it going to open up other things? But if the height isn't changing and you can say you can do whatever you want within the realm of that structure as long as that height doesn't go up because of a view. Mr. Maziotti, do you, do you foresee or... Mr. Smith, do either of you foresee any problems that the board would create for the homeowners by simply interpreting the 1969 decision to say the intent was not to obstruct a view and the work being done is not going to hinder a view, therefore the work could go forward? Without us going further to alter or tamper with this one-story restriction, in the 1969 variants. Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I think that that's as far as the board would need to go because that would allow the, the code enforcement officer to issue the permit. Uh, the problem becomes definitional as to what is a story, what's a story and a half, and what's two stories. One could argue that in one place of that house it's two stories because it has a daylight basement. Right. I don't think that that was the intent at the time. It really was designed to limit the, the physical configuration of the building on the lot and how much space it took up and what impact it had on the surrounding properties. So I, I think that we, we will meet all of those tests. If you have a Cape Cod with a dorma, is that a two-story building? Probably not. Most people would call it a story and a half at most, and then there are people who would still call it a, a one-story house. The uh, I mean, it goes back to the, the Webster's definition is that while the exterior may have one definition, the interior can have a completely different definition. And it's the interior definition that we're looking to uh, flesh out so that the renovations can take place. I think that, the, that if the board is inclined to uh, permit the renovations and not restrict and, and not define a one story as a limitation on what can be done interior, in the interior of the property, that solves our problem. Uh, and I think, as, as Ms. Jordan suggested, is that so long as the exterior of the building, uh, its height and its footprint are changed, then we really have kept faith with the original intent of the, of the uh, 69 variants. Well, just so that it's clear as to what my concern is, I'm inclined to grant, 
um, Mr. Richard and Ms. Barnacle, um, their request to do what they want to do. But I want to make sure that if we do that, that we're doing it the right way and when they're not create, we're not creating problems for them if they try and obtain mortgage financing or some, or try and resell the property and have somebody raise the question of whether or not um, the house is built uh, not in conformity with that's the variance that was issued in 1969. That's, already, that's actually already been addressed. That, that came up during the, the, the mortgage inspection for uh, present owners. Uh, and basically, I wrote a letter saying that there's no records that indicate that anything other than what was built was what the town had approved, and therefore one has to assume that that that, that what's on the face of the earth is is okay, and that and they, and they they bought that and it worked. I mean, I wasn't looking for a way to fix it. I was well, just saying that I I did extensive research of the of the records to see if I could find anything that would indicate that there was, that it was a violation, there was a problem, that anything other than what was built was, you know, different, and I couldn't find anything. So that issue has already been raised with what's existing. Uh, Mr. Maziotti, are there any deed restrictions on this lot? Uh, I did not do the title, but I'm not aware of any. I don't believe so. Uh, Mr. Smith, is is it your impression that the original denial in 1969 was due to the encroachment upon setbacks? That's true. And because there was encroachment on setbacks, that gave uh, a neighbor a basis for opposition. If that original house had been built within the building, envelope according to the ordinance at that time it could have been a two-story dwelling is this correct could have been up to the whatever height restrictions it was and if it's like today it's 35 feet so yes it could have been so substantially more approached on the setbacks he, it's because of the that. neighbor opposed he was limited to a one-story building and the last sentence of the second paragraph states a two-story building would cut off the latter's view, being Lot 41. That's correct. And I think it's important to understand that this, is, this was their form of findings of fact, and that was the finding of fact. They didn't put down that, you know, over two bedrooms would, would create too much noise for the neighbor. Uh, I think if that had been a real issue, that they would have listed that. I'm speculating, but I believe that's the finding which led them to, to the fact that they limited to a one story. And the, I too am trying to uh, solve this issue as to what the intent was. If height was a restriction, then they certainly could have built a, a ranch or one story house with a much lower ridge height because you see those all over, all over town with a, would you say a typical ranch five, 12. would be a 5 and 12, 5 12? Yeah. And this was a 9 12. Uh, and that statement that, that this would not cut off the neighbor's view or ladder's view being lot 41, they were happy with it appears to me they're happy with ridge height. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the files to indicate they weren't. Right. Uh, now, the I think in my mind that's quite obvious that that it's a height restriction. If the neighbor who was in opposition at the time was concerned with height, he could have stated a maximum ridge height or a more typical ranch style roof. 512 roof instead of a 912, which is a higher pitch, uh, a 512 roof would not permit the addition of dormers and a living space that you could stand up in. And a, and a five, typical 512 ranch roof, you cannot do that. This 
ridge height permits that. Now, I'm the other side of my concern, and maybe you can answer this directly, and that is the impact on other properties. I'm personally familiar with at least two other properties that are restricted to one story height or one story presentation. Uh, both of those houses would have benefited by the fact of adding the second story. And at point of sale, this became somewhat of a negative impact that a one story house could no longer be expanded upward to a two story. Both of the roofs on those houses were in the neighborhood of 512. So they would not have permitted this exception or option to take advantage of a higher pitch roof, which this house. Now, based on your experience in town, or, and, and the two houses that I'm referring to that I'm familiar with are both deed restricted houses. This apparently is not a deed restricted house. I don't know if we can make a distinction on that line. Uh, deed restricted house has any different or more meaningful impact than a uh, encroachment on setback restriction. But one concern that I might have is that if this satisfies the original argument of not affecting the neighbor's view uh, would cut off the neighbor's view or ladder's view being lot 41. Will this negatively impact other houses in town that are restricted to one story that have a 512 or thereabouts roof that do not permit a second story? Could this be a basis of comparison? And I don't know that it would, because the two that I'm aware of are both deed restricted, and this is a different situation. But if, if, if this applicant is permitted to have a second story, because in my mind it doesn't appear to affect a view, it's a, it's a reverse water view in this situation. It's an uphill view or <coughs> opposite well, water view. Uh, the, the neighbor was satisfied with the ridge height. So it, it's, it, that's an issue that I think can we start out of how we'll have on other one-story houses. Well, you know, I think if it's deed restrictions, I don't think it's anything the town can get involved with to begin with. But that said, um, standards for hardship for variance back in 1969 and the standards for hardship today in a shoreland zone are the same. They're not, shoreland zone lots are not dictated by practical difficulty as, as, as all lots outside of shoreland are. So even though it's nice to have input from neighbors and uh, about whether they like particular height or not, the board's decision today and then probably really shouldn't have been based on the fact that somebody would lose a view because that wasn't one of the criteria to begin with. Nor is it today. It would do what? That last statement? Would you repeat? The, 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 the height of lose, unfortunately, for those people who are on back lots, unless it's a deed restriction, a variance for approval or denial should not be based on whether somebody would be losing their view not on the variance criteria. The four variance criteria we have on the books has nothing to do with whether you're going to lose a view or not. And it's, although it's nice to have the neighbors have input and are able to speak, the bottom line is that's not one of the criteria for approval or denial. So I'm, in that respect, I think they took into consideration Dr. Ferguson's and they come up with a, with a plan that he was happy with, but I'm not sure that, that even even then, it was truly something they should have got into, nor should they today, or should this board today. I don't know if that helps at all, but... Um. How, how would this same situation apply? Could you argue the same situation if there was a deed restriction in this law? Couldn't and do it. not a variance, town ordinance variance? Would that affect 
uh, mortgage and, and, and oh, could that be arguable in a higher court of law, for example? No, I don't believe so. I'm, I'm trying to think of a way that that could uh, be argued around, uh, that you could argue around a deed restriction. I can't think of any. The restrictions are generally placed for the benefit of the surrounding neighbors and any one of whom would have standing to prevent the expanded use of a property that's been restricted by a provision in a deed. So I, I don't know of any way to get around that. So even if, the, even if this board were to grant a variance, it wouldn't have any effect on the deed restriction. You can't avoid that. That's a contracted for provision. And when you purchase the home, you accepted that, the term of that contract. And without the grantor or whoever else is affected by that deed consenting to a change, then it would be applied without exception. So no, there's no way that I can think of uh, that even if the board were to consider a variance for those other properties that you mentioned, that those could in any way affect the restriction that, that's carried in the deed. Mr. Chairman? Yes. May Mr. Trent Bagley. Yes. We still have a discussion on this, uh, on this matter. Join right in. Um, I've been struggling uh, with this, I think, with everyone on this on this board, and um, I guess my difficulty is, is, is I think the applicants are looking for some relief, and I personally feel that you need some relief from this 1969 variance. But I, I, I sort of mirror uh, Mr. Ba uh, uh, Chairman's conclusions that the variance, and it was written in 1969, is very little conclusions or findings of fact, and we're all making speculations on why the variance was granted and why it was met. But the variance reads a two-bedroom, not to oversimplify it, um, one-story home. And we can discuss these dimensions, but what we now have is a potential you know, from a two-bedroom, one-and-a-half-bath home to a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath home. And I think, personally, again, I think you need relief from this variance, but I'm not quite certain by appealing a permit decision and leaving the variance unmodified that it takes liability away from either the town or yourselves in the future. I guess my point is one of not being an attorney is, is getting some uh, legal input as it's the only, I can tell you this is the only recourse. I mean a variance, a hardship variance, if they had approached the board with a hardship variance, that planning question could not either real return could not be met. So, I mean, they, that's why they didn't approach the board. Um, because it's almost impossible. I mean, it's it's within Shoreland zone area, so we're under hardship criteria, not practical difficulty. Uh, so there, is, there isn't another recourse. Um, had there been a recourse, I'm sure the applicant would have probably taken that initially. Bruce, what is the definition of hardship? Where can you cite it in the ordinance? Yeah, it's on page 49 <clears throat> of the variance. It's uh, of our ordinance. It's 19-5-2B2. At least is the undue hardship um, standard that exists in a shoreland performance overlay district. So this property can't come under the practical difficulty standard. In fact, one of the last element of the practical difficulty standard that we always go through is that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas. And this property, of course, is being within 250 feet of the ocean. So they fall within undue hardship, which requires very strict findings. A through D? A through D, that's right. That's why it doesn't even get into the issue of somebody losing a view, practical difficulty. Granted, granted uh, it talks about um, eliminating privacy of adjoining properties and, and, and the value, reducing the value and the like. Hardship is so clear-cut that you don't even have to get that far. I mean, 
basically hardship is for somebody who's got a lot that's non-conforming that they've owned that just, they just can't build on it unless unless they, need, they seek relief. Mm -hmm. It isn't really for an, a building that, that can bring a reasonable return in the way it's existing. So you don't even get that far in shoreland zone if you pay if you really go by the true intent of the hardship. Well, I think where we stand, at least where I stand on this, from having heard the discussion, um, um, is that I'm inclined to grant the relief. Um, and if the applicant is comfortable, and if our code enforcement officer is comfortable, that by simply having us interpret by declaration, by fiat, the meaning or the intent of the board in the 1969 ordinance, if that's sufficient, I'm willing to go down that road. Uh, but it's, you know, with the understanding that there will still be in place a 1969 ordinance that at least by, not ordinance, a decision of this board that by its term says that the variance was to, to construct a two bedroom, one story house. And we can interpret that to say that the intent of the board at that time was not to cut off the view of an adjoining property and that the intent of the board was to grant the applicant's request at that time for the construction of a house design as presented to them, which happened to be a two-bedroom, one-story house, but that it's our opinion that that board at the time would have just as easily approved a three or four bedroom, two story house that had the same dimensions. And I think that's at least what I'm hearing from Ms. Jordan and I. <coughs> all, all, based on, all based on the finding of fact that this two, sto a two story house would cut off the lattice view. The, the only thing I can add to that. Right. Is, the, the only thing I would add to that, Mr. Chairman, is that the design of this house is atypical. It doesn't really lend itself to a definition in any other characterization. You usually have a colonial or a cape or a gambrel or some common definition of a house. This one is a unique design. So it may have been for convenience that the application of, the, uh, of its use was a way of describing the house since there's, it's very difficult to describe in any other terms. So I, it, and it is a, I think it is a reasonable inter interpretation and I think that it, it poses a relatively small risk, if any, to the, uh, to the appellant uh, down the road. Uh, I think that's a risk well worth taking. And I believe that, that a court, if this were to be challenged, uh, would defer to the board and the continuity of its decision making. I don't think it would go in and upset that. Back to your original, uh, one of your original statements in looking at the ability for us to modify this board's decision. Uh, since there is no deed involved, can we proceed along that line? With, would that not be the easiest way to handle this? Do we have it in our jurisdiction to modify a, a previous decision? No. Well, I, I don't see that we no. do. That's why I was sort of leafing through the ordinance we while Mr. Question. Maziotti was making his presentation. So we that was a specific to... question of my kill. You can't modify that decision. You can, you can interpret the meaning of that decision. Right. Okay. But you can't, you can't modify it. But we can interpret or expand upon what we assume their intent was. That's that was my understanding from the town attorney, and I think he told uh, Mr. Maziotti the same thing. So it is within our, it, and in which case we wouldn't be rescinding this. We would just be clarifying. Clarifying with. Again, I think the, that last sentence of the second paragraph is, is key to that path, to that decision, is that the existing elevation profile, now these are my words, the existing elevation profile does not affect or is satisfy the view concerns of the neighborhood. And has satisfied the town in the fact that that's what they accepted. Which was the basis for the restriction is the neighbor's concern the town responded 
Correct. And, and they presented an elevation profile, which the neighbor found acceptable. One has to assume that. Yes. I feel comfortable with viewing it along that line. Okay, well, any other questions at this point for Mr. Maziotti or the um, appellants? Okay. Well, you may now take your seat again. And once again, is there anybody else who would like to speak in favor of or in opposition to the appeal? No? Okay. Um, discussion among the board, or have we already discussed this enough to go to a motion? Hearing no other discussion, who would like to uh, venture into the wording of the motion? Ms. Miller? No? no Dr. Doctor, doctor, okay. <clears throat> and mind you, I am going to have to go to work tomorrow morning and tell the senior partner at my law firm that I granted an appeal for his next door neighbors. <laughs> and not only have I granted it, I'm making the motion, so he will either like me or hate me, and we'll see. I move to accept or grant the administrative appeal of Michael Richard and Susan Barnacle to allow renovations of their property located at One Maiden, One Maiden Cove. Cove. One Maiden Cove. Map U05, lot 40, whereby interpreting the 1969 Zoning Board of Appeals decision to mean that a one story property may not exceed. Should it be the dimensions of the structure rather than continue to use one-story property? That's not the right job. That the 1969 decision sh um, was intended to limit the exterior and dimensions of the home. Exterior dimensions of the home. Mm -hmm. Maybe is that covered? That, is that serve the purpose, Council? Well, um, I, I think we, we probably should also add um, where we're getting that, the basis for that interpretation. Um, in other words... Well, you don't have to do that as part of the motion. You could yeah, make I it as finding. The finding of fact, the facts, the motion is just kind of summarizing what we discussed. This well, is part of the appeal. This is part of his record. Is that it? We can say the 19, <clears throat> July 23rd, 1969 decision granted by Secretary Richard Robinson, Secretary of the Zoning Board of Appeals. We need to define it. Well, um, I, I think I'd, I, I would like to expound, expand upon it a little bit, if you don't mind. You set me up for this. I didn't, I, did, I swear. <laughs> um, if we could um, expand upon the motion to say, um, you know, whereby the decision of the Board of, Zone of, Bo decision of the Board of Zoning Appeals dated July 23, 1969, expressly stated that a two story house would cut off the views of the abutting property then owned by Dr. Franklin Ferguson. Um, it is the opinion of this board that the uh, intent of the board when issuing its decision in 1969 was not to restrict the construction 
of a home limited to two bedrooms of, in one story, but rather to restrict the exterior dimensional uh, configuration to the house as currently constructed. And this board is willing to permit the uh, granting of a building permit to, to modify the interior uh, construction of the home. Well, I think you need to say that to grant it, uh, permit the code officer to do the permit. You don't have any authority to actually issue the permit. Well, yes, to permit our code enforcement officer to grant a building permit to finish the construction of the attic portion of the house and to add dormers um, as depicted on the plans attached to and submitted as part of the appeal. Well, not to exceed the already existing height, right? Not to, yeah, yeah. not to exceed the existing height of the residence. <laughs> now, why did he ask you to do that, Catherine? Uh, he's a lawyer. <laughs> Last time I checked, you were too. <laughs> is your motion, is that, which one, are we going to be yours and? Well, let's put the superfluous language. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So moved. Do we have a second to Ms. Miller's motion? Are you going to call my motion? <laughs> <laughs> I do second it. You don't even need to read it back. <laughs> a second, Ms. Jordan. Discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion is approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Mr. Maziotti, you are excused. The next item on our agenda is to hear the appeal of Martin and Cynthia Berry, 1155 Sawyer Road, tax map R04, lot 55C, for a left side property line variance of four feet, six inches from the required 25 feet, and a right side property line variance of nine feet, three inches from the required 25 feet to construct a second floor over the existing dwelling. Mr. Chair and other members of the board, um, the Berries are neighbors very in close proximity to my own home and also friends of our family. So at this point, I will excuse myself. Mr. LaPlante having excused himself or recused himself, uh, would you state your name and address, please? My name is Martin Barry. This is my wife, Cynthia. We live at 1155 Sawyer Road. Good evening, Chairman and board members. Thank you for considering our request for left and right side variants. We had a second floor addition to our ranch style home. <clears throat> We've lived in the Cape Elizabeth for 16 years. Our children have been attending the schools here all their lives, and our need for expansion is long overdue. The, we see that the, the strict application of the ordinance would cause significant economic injury to us because others in the neighborhood would, would have what we would like to achieve. In section six in your books are some of the homes on Sawyer Road when they, within a four-tenths mile radius that have two stories. We have looked uh, for larger housing in Cape but have been unable to afford any of them. 
especially where housing Cape Elizabeth averages now in the high $200,000 range. <clears throat> Sawyer Road itself is a unique rural neighborhood with a variety of styles of homes. Adding a second story to our home, we feel would not adversely affect the neighborhood, nor would it cast any shadows or obstructions of any views. We have seen the addition of uh, Elizabeth Farms and most recently Cross Hill. But we see our practical dif difficulty is, is not due to our actions. The town's setback requirements have changed since our house was built back in the early 1960s. Also, in, uh, I may add, in 19, uh, 1987, the town took back 350 square feet by intimate domain <clears throat> to bring the road up to our DOT standards. Just prior to this, um, uh, I was under the understanding there was a certain amount of square foot required for a uh, building lot. And, uh, uh, acquiring that information, I did purchase an additional 11,500 uh, 11, square foot lot in the back to make our lot more conforming. And that was just prior to the town's taking. But now there, there is no additional land that, that we could have purchased to make our lot conforming. Uh, we have looked into expanding our home outward, but this would cause economic hardship. Due to the added cost of uh, foundation work, uh, roofing materials, etc., and, and we really think that um, it would be quite unsightly. <clears throat> it would also have more of an impact on the environment. <clears throat> we also must consider future replacement of our septic system. Our current system is fine. In section seven, uh, uh, we've had, uh, uh, let's see, in section seven, we did have uh, an engineer, engineering company, um, Sebago Techniques. Um, their representative was uh, John Toothaker. He came over and did an analysis of the septic system we have now. <clears throat> and, he didn't see any problem with uh, with what we had for a system, but we we prefer to uh, expect the worst. So we we really don't want to go expand to the back in case of uh, rules change, variances change that would require down the road a septic system to be installed, other than where it is right now. So, as we see it, the only feasible way uh, and, uh, would be uh, actually raising the elevation of our home, adding a second floor, rather than extending out on the back. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> In Section 8, our neighbors strongly support our project. Um, I may also add that uh, Linda Miller, which resides right now at 1151, but did reside at 1157, just next door, she still owns that property, uh, um, took, it, uh, took her time and uh, wrote a letter to the board because she does abut us on three sides. Uh, my wife Send it to pass and let us out. And unfortunately, it came late to us. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> she wasn't able to attend the meeting tonight. <clears throat> yeah, she has no intentions of selling property next door. Gather and, and, uh, and she, as I said, uh, she has lived there before. She knows that when she looks out the side of her window, she sees our building. 
but by going up, that's not going to change. Those two windows are on that side of the building. Your view of uh, looking out those two windows. <clears throat> yeah, so she states in the letter, uh, <clears throat> the view from the ranch house that I own on the left of Barry's direct, uh, directly on Soya <clears throat> will not obstruct any, fur uh, any further than they, than they are presently. <clears throat> The third border that she has, uh, she said she is, is actually her driveway. And so now we're talking about the backyard. Her home sits way back in the backyard. So even I put three stories on, she would really never see uh, our building at all because she lives so far back. Oh. Section one, <clears throat> reading page uh, page six, pretty much describes the location of the building as it is now. Apologize for not num numbering the pages. <laughs> the application actually looks pretty good. Very good. You did a nice job putting it together. Thank you. I have to give my wife a lot of credit for that. <laughs> I guess uh, basically now I'm not really proficient in this. Uh, I, I you said you lived in Cape for 16 years. Have you lived here 16 years or have you lived in another location? How long have you been in this house? 16 years. Okay, wasn't yeah. sure. Yep. Oh, I may add, we, we have three children, and when we first moved in there, it's easy to put the little kids in, in a room, you know. But now they get to the, to the point where they, they, need, they need their privacy, they, they're young adults, and I need to treat them as such. Is that it, Mr. Berry? I guess that's it. I mean, don't feel compelled to, to go on. You've put together a nice application. Um, did, um, does uh, Mrs. Berry desire to make any additional presentation? Okay. Um, questions from members of the board for Mr. Berry? And currently, there are three bedrooms and one bath. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the driveway to your right hand side, which I believe is 1151 Sawyer Road, is that correct? Yes. Is that who is the owner of 1151? Linda uh, Miller. Okay. And she resides at, at 1151. Uh, yes. And she also owns 1157. Is that correct? Right. So I assume that's rental, rental property. It is now, yes. And you acquired additional property in 1987. That was to the rear of your lot. Yes, it was. And the owner at that time was, you acquired that? At, at that time, it was uh, John and Linda Miller. But that was acquired from 1151 lot? Right. So the address 1151. And your septic is in your front yard? They actually, uh, uh, the, the, the tank is in the front yard, and the uh, leach field as it is is around the front and down the side. 
And who is the owner of the property directly across the street? That's a, uh, uh, a preserve. That's, that, that's a protected resource that would never be built on. That, that's part of that trail that uh, runs up through Cape. So that's quite a large. It's a good track. Uh, a frontage on Sawyer in either direction, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. With no potential for building across the street in any of that area? I, I, uh, I've been told it's, that's a land uh, resource protected. In fact, just down the road is that uh, old Cape, and, and even that was on that land, had limitations on what could be built there. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Chapman, are you mulling over no. another one? Or are, you, are you done? No, thank okay. You. Um, thank you, Mr. Berry. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else here? I don't see anybody else in the room other than our member who has excused himself and the applicant's wife, so I'll assume that there's nobody here to speak against the proposal and nobody else here to speak in favor of it, in which case we'll close the public comment portion of the hearing and open it for board discussion. Discussion from members of the board. Uh, I think uh, that the Barry's application was very clear, that the presentation was uh, very effective, and I think the Thinking and you know, reasoning is clear to me. I don't see any problem with the application. Um, I don't either, and it seems um, quite similar to an application we considered last time we met, which was in March, when we heard Mr. LaPlante's application for um, similar construction. And since the, uh, LaPlante's home is just a few doors down on the opposite side of the street uh, from the Berries, um, I don't see any reason to treat one different than the other. They're surprisingly similar. Uh, well, that having been said, let's go through the elements um, of the ordinance. Um, if we can have... Uh, findings on each of these. Um, can I have a show of hands from members of the board um, as to those who find that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance? And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, a show of hands who those five. I'm sorry, thank you, Ms. Miller. Five. We've lost a member for this one. Um, uh, a show of hands uh, uh, from those who find that a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30-A, uh, Main Revised Statutes Annotated Section 4353-4C. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Um, a show of hands from those members of the board who find that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general circumstances of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That is found in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. Uh, those who, uh, showing of hands from those who find that the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties in determining whether a variance would have an undesirable detrimental effect on the use or market value of abutting properties, the zoning board shall consider if the variance would have the effect of blocking an established view, posing a fire safety hazard, casting a shadow on an adjoining lot, reducing the appraised value of an adjoining property by 10% or more, or of eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property without an effort to mitigate the lost privacy. 
And that is found in the affirmative. Five in favor, zero opposed. Uh, showing of, the, of hands from those who find that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. That is found in the affirmative. Five in favor, zero opposed. Uh, those who find that no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Also in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. Those who find that the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. Found in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. And last, uh, those who find that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And also in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. Um, then last, for a motion, um, Um, can I have a motion substantially as follows, whereas four or more voting members of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals have found that the applicants, Martin and Cynthia Berry, have established that a practical difficulty exists with respect to the applicant's property at 1155 Sawyer Road, tax map R04, lot 55C, Um, in accordance with the provisions of section 19-5-2B1 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, um, and whereas four or more voting members of the board have found that the applicant has met the applicant's burden of proof in establishing that all conditions specified in section 19-5-2B1 have been met, I therefore move that the application for a variance for a left side property line variance of four feet six inches from the required 25 feet and a right side property line variance of nine feet three inches from the required 25 feet to construct a second floor over the existing uh, dwelling as specified in the application uh, be approved. Uh, motion Ms. Miller. Second. Second. Mr. Tranfaglia. Uh, discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion is approved. Five in favor, zero opposed. Mr. and Mrs. Berry, you're excused. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That concludes new business, communications on the agenda. Bruce, do we have any? No, we don't. Which takes us to adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Ms. Miller, second. Second it. Ms. Jordan, all those in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>